So this guy goes into a bar. He runs into a bar, slams open the door, runs up to the bartender, sl slams his hand on his, his hand on the bar and says, bartender, quick, give me a shot before it happens. The bartender's like, okay, pours him a shot, slams a shot, he goes, bartender, quick, give me another shot before it happens. The bartender's like, all right, a little more suspicious, pours him a shot, the guy slams it. Bartender, quick, give me another shot before it happens. The bartender's like, now he's a little more suspicious, slowly pours another shot, the guy slams back. Bartender, quick, give me another shot before it happens. The bartender's like, look, man, if I'm gonna keep giving you shots, I gotta see some money. He goes, oh, it just happened. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hold on, let me think of a better one then. Um, uh, okay, so my name is Brendan Salmon. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of systematic theology at St. Joseph's University. So I do um, a theology, really it's a theology of beauty. It also goes by the name Theological Aesthetics. Um, the long-term goal is to somehow take the resources of a theology of beauty and sort of merge it with a theology of disability. And so I think that ultimately a theology of beauty brings us into contact with different sort of ways of thinking, ways of what you might call ways of mind, ways of being, that I think is a very valuable resource for trying to understand human, the phenomenon of human disability. And so, so there's a lot of approaches to disability today based on certain <clears throat> currents and trends of thought. And so the idea that I sort of, when I was doing a theology of beauty or theological aesthetics came across was, you know, can we ask different questions about human disability that tries, instead of trying to just simply integrate into society and these sorts of things, that tries to um, ask the question, can we see the beauty of human disability? And so what, what might that entail? Um, and so I looked at the sort of the tradition of a theology of beauty and found a wealth of, of riches for asking questions and approaching that phenomenon. So I think it's difficult to, to sort of understand the link between beauty and disability because I think we're sort of conditioned to imagine, I mean, our, our minds and our imaginations are already disciplined in certain ways with respect to understanding disability. And of course, that's a that can be a powerful sort of means by which we can change minds and hearts, of course, about it. Um, and I think the current way that people think about disability, you know, is is either as something very tragic, which it is in many accounts in some respect, I guess, or as some sort of, you know, a challenge, but always a challenge with the goal of trying to integrate within a kind of neurotypical framework that, that we've set up as a neurotypical framework. So, so I think there's a kind of understanding of disability that comes from the currents within our social consciousness. One of which is certainly not seeing the beauty of human disability um, because it tends to be something that people suffer from. But of course in the Christian tradition there is this idea of the value of suffering in some way. Um, and and, it, and it, you know a lot of it depends on how one talks about that. I mean we're not going to sort of praise suffering, that's not the idea. but. The idea is certainly there. It's been there in the Western intellectual tradition that beauty is, is such that it isn't something immediately on the surface. There's a depth of it. And so the idea that, that human disability might be beautiful really requires a whole new way of looking at both disability and beauty. And I just think that because today we have this <clears throat> way of understanding those things within a kind of you know modern Western mindset, um, which isn't all bad. I mean, there's a lot of good has come from that. I just think there's a better way we can we can work with it and understand it more. Um, and because there's just a certain lack of knowledge of that tradition, of the Western sort of intellectual tradition about beauty, that it strikes us as weird to sort of link that to disability at that point. But, but that's hopefully what I'm going to try and change <laughs> on some level. And it, I mean, I, I come at this because I was sort of brought into the world of human disability with my first son, and that sort of just, be, he became you know, sort of the center of my theological orbit, you might say, in some respects, I kind of started to f think always with an eye towards him, and it sort of just came out of that experience of having him and sort of what I was doing with beauty, and I saw these two things very helpful. Everything I, w I was studying in this tradition of beauty gave me ways of, of reimagining my son's condition, and, and therefore I think 
the phenomenon of human disability in general. When I started to, I guess, explore this, this, the theological tradition in the West with respect to beauty as its fundamental object, which is really what theological aesthetics is, it's kind of taking, as von Balazar says, taking beauty as your first word, because it, it kind of provides you with a grammar, it provides you with a way of thinking <clears throat> that can really tap into the idea of a mystery without wanting to solve the mystery and kind of celebrating the mystery, allowing the mystery to draw me further into various objects of inquiry as long as I recognize that there's a kind of mystery to it. I think the first thing then was, you know, that, that this kind of embrace of mystery. Um, when I was sort of pursuing studies, both as a master's student and then, and then later, um, and anyone involved in, <coughs> excuse me, in, you know, um, advanced degrees, certainly within the humanities, We'll confront at some point inevitably how do we how do we ask these questions? What are, what is the goal? And I think there's a strong sense that you know all thought and all all inquiry should be oriented towards coming up with a definitive solution. And in the tradition of beauty, what I found was there's a way of thinking that um, can sort of obviously embrace that idea of coming to determinate and definitive answers, but also there's always a kind of surplus or a more that you know draws us in, and so this idea that there's a mystery and mystery is not an empty thing that we have to fill, mystery is not a problem we have to solve, but mystery is this phenomenon that sort of calls us and draws us into it and opens us to, to sort of the otherness of, of whatever it is we've come from, the otherness of God, the otherness of being, the otherness of other beings um, was really there within the, in that tradition, especially in that idea of, of mystery drawing a person closer to it in order to really kind of give it its abundance, not, you know, to have a problem solved. And so, um, when my, when, so in my, in my own experience with my son's birth, I kind of saw it as this surplus, this mysterious other that, that wasn't a problem, right? That, but that was something that, that he brought uniquely to the human family. And so, that was sort of the first, the first dimension of it, I think, is sort of recognizing that there is a mysterious otherness to all human disability um, that is attractive in its own right. It just requires a kind of way of seeing. And so, in part, the whole discipline of theological aesthetics um, concerns, again, I mean, I'm, I'm not Bal Balthazarian, but certainly in love of Balthazar, but concerns what Balthazar says is seeing the form, like really seeing something for what it is, um, seeing its depth, seeing how its depth is obviously connected to its kind of outward appearance. And, and within that, you know, when it comes to a phenomenon like, like human disability, it allows us to sort of understand that there is something very um, rich happening within the lives of people we consider disabled. And that if we can but see the form, we can start to see a beauty that they offer as well. I mean, there were other principles in the tradition um, that one sort of happens upon this idea that, you know, unity and plurality coexist within the, the phenomenon of beauty, perhaps most intensely, more than any other sort of shared human experiences. And if unity and plurality can coexist, then it sort of obviously opens up a space for otherness to enter into um, one's understanding of both oneself and the world and, and of course, the divine other, um, which was very important as well. Um, there's a kind of, there's also a, I mean, this, this could get pedantic, but there's also this tradition within <clears throat> inquiries into beauty that, that understand beauty as having what the Greeks call this anagogical power, this, this idea that beauty, when we are confronted with something beautiful, a kind of expansion, you, to use modern language, a kind of expansion of consciousness starts to happen. Beauty impresses itself upon us. It kind of um, reveals to us something we didn't know we wanted. I think this is a, a hugely important dimension uh, of beauty as well. That it, it shows us something we desired that we didn't know we desired, right? And so, <clears throat> again, with that in mind, when, when my son's birth came, it was, I mean, there was just a kind of openness that I had to it, that I, it was un totally unexpected, of course, and this sort of disposition that says, um, that sort of encouraged at least the way that I thought to understand this as 
a kind of a surprise of an otherness that, that was completely unexpected, um, but that draws me into it, wanting to know more about it. Increase my, it was the moment sort of he was born. It was like I was brought into a whole new community um, that I hadn't really been involved in before, but it was part of society I knew. And so this is that sort of anagogical dimension that beauty not only expands consciousness, but it, but in so doing it provokes us, <coughs> sorry, it provokes us um, to ask different questions, it provokes us to want to know more. Um, and, and so in expanding consciousness, it also elevates our desire, you might say, to understand the phenomena that are beautiful. And it does all this all the while maintaining its kind of mysterious surplus, which I think is, is just so vital for all theological inquiry, um, the capacity to be drawn in, the capacity to sort of want to know what it is one is seeking without having to sort of definitively solve it or exhaustively know it. And so these were, I think, enormous principles for the way that I understood my son's condition, the condition of all human disability, um, that there's a mysteriousness, there's like a mystery to it that we should know more about. There's an otherness that we should, that, that needs to be welcomed because it's an otherness that in many ways provides a, a very important dimension of human nature, namely to be dependent, right, is, is, I mean, to be human means to be dependent upon otherness, and perhaps nowhere is that seen more than in human disability. So it, I mean, it, it illuminates a dimension of our human nature, and of course illumination is another principle that is there within the tradition of beauty. Beauty illuminates things, and um, draw, drawing to light their surplus, which you might say the more to them that we seek to know. So when I was just doing my master's, um, I had kind of gotten drawn into the thought of Thomas Aquinas. And what I loved about Aquinas, <clears throat> sorry, was that he seemed to have a way of understanding and articulating mystery in a way that makes it intelligible, but not exhaustively intelligible. Another way to put it is this, is that there are phenomena in the world of human experience, there are phenomena that are the basic sort of constitute, constitutive properties of human experience that are intelligible in a way without being determinately intelligible. What that means is there are phenomena that for us we can somehow understand them at a kind of base level of our existence, but that we might not be able to give verbal expression to, that, are, that, we, find, that we struggle to find words to explain. And, and really <clears throat> in, the, in, the, in the sort of Western tradition, the intellectual tradition, <clears throat> beauty is often sort of early on in the in the Neoplatonic um, understanding of a beauty is identified as this surplus of intelligible content, something that is something that I'm confronted by when I when I'm confronted by something beautiful that is intelligible to me, but is not intelligible in the way that say truth is intelligible to me. <clears throat> what that means is an experience of the beautiful is an experience that makes sense at perhaps the deeper levels of my existence, but that I struggle then to form concepts and to use categories to try and explain. The phenomenon of love, for example, is perhaps one of the most common that we have with respect to that. Um, phenomenon like faith, art, the various arts, experiences of the arts, um, which is why I think artists have to turn to a different mode of expression because they reach the limits of verbal expression when they're kind of confronting what it is they want to articulate what it is that has that has called to them that has grasped them um, this mysterious other and so beauty and mystery come together in the sense that both mystery and beauty are these kind of surplus of intelligible content something that makes sense to us and draws us into them and being drawn in we then work to try to give it various express expressivity you might say we might we, we struggle to express what it is we're, we're drawn into and we sometimes give it verbal content and we can use you know, regular discursive thought. Maybe we turn to a poetic kind of language. Maybe we you know, write music, we write odes. Um, we maybe move to tears, something like this. But we're, we're always moved by what is intelligible, even if it's not intelligible in a way that allows us to express it using conventional language, and things like that. Um, and so that's where I think beauty and mystery really come together. And I know in the experience of, of again, the birth of my son and now his eight years of existence, um, I've always looked at him as being this kind of moment 
of an intelligibility that is just too much for me to understand, <clears throat> which, I mean, is, I think, just sort of the, defines the common human experience of love. That's why we have to be brought in through love and sort of the intellect follows. Love allows me to bond myself to something that is too much, um, but that because it's too much, I want to be in relationship with. And, and in that relationship, it provokes me to levels of wonder, levels of imagination, um, and ultimately levels of seeing, seeing the divine, because this is really where a theology of beauty kind of centers itself. Beauty in the tradition um, is known as one of the divine names and, and so what that means is that, I mean, in the tradition of the divine names, it's, it's believed that there are certain perfections associated with the divine being itself that enter into the formal sort of properties of, of created entities. So some of these names include the good, the true, the beautiful, the one, wisdom is another one, love is another one. These are, the way I kind of say it is a divine name is, is what you might say is God's public appearance. Not public in a way that's opposed to private, because I would kind of, I think buy into a modern paradigm of, of the privacy of religion, which this tradition doesn't maintain. So, pr so public <clears throat> as opposed to intimate, where, where God also reveals himself in various ways to communities that try to respond to that revelation. Beauty, truth, love, the good, these are all ways in which God reveals himself publicly to everybody that then constitute our most commonly shared experiences of the divine presence in a way. Um, and so these are names of God because they identify these perfections of God that enter into the formal experience of, of human beings. Um, and, and really that's where beauty and mystery I think also come together. So I, I think all human beings have a sense of the beautiful. I think, I think it's, it's so deeply sort of rooted within us. It's part of the DNA of our being um, to, to desire. And it's also part of the DNA of what it is to be human, to want to know. And so typically you have the principle that draws desire described as the good, another one of the divine names. And when the good draws us and we seek to just not just know it, but obviously to have it, to possess it, to love it. Part of that involves knowing it. And when it is known, and certainly when it is known within certain conventional conceptual ways, then it is taken in by us where it is experienced as truth. <clears throat> and so these are two modes in which, in the divine name tradition, you might say God communicates himself in sort of the more philosophical reconfiguration of that tradition. Um, these are what are called transcendental properties of being. Being also reveals itself in these ways that human beings can encounter it. It's always the same. So the good is the same as the true, is the same as being, is the same as beauty, although beauty is a little co more controversial within the tradition of the transcendental properties of being. But the point is that being gives itself as the good because it draws human desire. And then when desire is sort of open to it and explores it and tries to seek what it is it desires, to know it more. Once it grasps it, it becomes truth to us. And so there's this middle ground between <clears throat> the good and the true, which classically was always identified up until around the modern period. And even then afterwards, it's still, it just gets redefined in a different way, but it's, it's sort of the place where beauty is. In other words, um, for the good to draw us and then for us to be able to sort of capture it conceptually as the true, there has to be this middle I don't know what you'd call it, a kind of moment in the middle between being experienced as good and then as true, where the good becomes oriented toward my faculties of cognition, as Aquinas would say. And in that moment where the good starts to orient itself to the faculties of my cognition, it is experienced as beauty. Um, and that gets very complex. But another way of understanding it is <clears throat> beauty is that which allows desire to sort of turn into knowledge. So all human beings are desiring something, which means, of course, that, that love is very much bound up with the act of knowing. Um, and that, again, kind of goes against what we're typically conditioned to think, right? If I'm supposed to know something, I can't love it. I have to bracket out all of my desire for it, and I have to sort of leave it at a neutral place. But in the tradition of the theology of beauty and the theological aesthetic approach, you can't ever eliminate love and desire from the act of knowing because we always have an invested interest in objects we want to know. We're always drawn to them for some reason. And the principle 
that draws us to them, that attracts us to objects we want to know, um, is, is beauty ultimately. Because it's beauty that allows the good to start to show itself for my capacity to see it. And then it draws me in and then I want to know it. And, and once I kind of start to know it, it reveals itself as true and it becomes true. And in my act of making it understandable in some sense, which is a classical understanding of truth. Um, the act of the intellect that perfects the truth that otherwise is sort of dis in a dispersed state as beauty, you might say, and, and we're attracted to it ultimately as, as the good. But that's, that's that process of good, beauty, and then truth. And that's where beauty sort of shows its anagogical side. Um, it also shows that it's deeply bound up with the intellect. So beauty, where we tend to associate it more with the senses today, in the tradition it was always something that was very profoundly intellectual. It was, um, it's sort of where sense and intellect meet. And this is sort of what ends up happening in the modern period too. These, these thinkers who, who really kind of dive into, into beauty and start creating what's now called the science of aesthetics or the, the discourse of aesthetic thought um, understand that there's some point at which sense and intellect have to, have to merge. And, and so that's, that's really where beauty's anagogical power, I think, releases itself. Um, helping us to realize that. I mean, a lot of what I'm sort of saying concerns this idea that when we become more explicitly aware of these things that are happening both in being itself, in human experience, in human consciousness, and the world outside is where we can, I think, start to um, ask questions differently. For example, with respect to something like human disability or ask questions about politics, ask questions about economics, because we are brought to a place where we see the way that the good and, and the true are, are united in this phenomenon of beauty, for example. And, and so, you know, we're able to sort of understand why we're attracted to things um, and, and what questions that might release and, and how that might alert our, our gaze and our consciousness to other objects that may have been, we may have been missing precisely just because we weren't looking, you know. So it, it really provokes consciousness. It provokes me to look in different places. It provokes new questions. Um, which is really where it has its sort of intellectual side. Well, one of the interesting things about this theology of beauty is that it, when it sort of, when it takes hold of a person, when beauty becomes one's first word, it's almost, it, it's very difficult to reject anything because you do see, <clears throat> at least I do, you do see something attractive in almost every field. and so. The, the shift that I think you're kind of referring to, certainly in the modern period, um, has to do a lot with reactions against skepticism. There's a whole movement, you know, a whole new sort of philosophical movement that takes hold after Descartes with Husserl and phenomenology and these kinds of things where experience and consciousness and imminence is emphasized over transcendence. And so there's even a rejection of transcendence altogether, which of course makes classical um, recovering classical notions very difficult because it doesn't sort of fit within that paradigm of imminence and the consciousness. Um, I don't reject that. I think that that's a very important dimension of human thought and I think it's very important to understand that and to explore that. I think what I reject is sort of the absolutizing of that um, such that everything now has to be measured by this particular emphasis in, in the modern period. Um, and so I've been influenced by a lot of thinkers. One of the more sort of the modern thinkers that I've been influenced by is a philosopher called William Desmond. Um, we're releasing a volume on his stuff soon as well. Chris Simpson and I'm sure you guys know Chris. You know. Um, and and it was his philosophy that really I think enabled me to um, to not only understand beauty's role in thought itself because a lot of what he's doing as a philosopher. Un, in many ways unknowingly um, taps into this tradition of beauty because I say unknowingly because he's not that's not what he's purposefully doing he's just creating kind of a metaphysics which is which is very much in touch with the sort of post Kantian post Cartesian subject consciousness and this kind of stuff human experience and the need for that but also um, very much in, in touch with more medieval and classical notions and, and principles that are part of the, the which you might call the metaphysical, a certain current within the metaphys metaphysical tradition. Um, so what brought me to seeing beauty in this respect was really a kind of emergence between, or a merger between Desmond's metaphysics and then how I was reading Aquinas and other figures in the tradition, Bonaventure and Dionysius, and, and even thinkers like Plato and Aristotle. Um, 
and and so when I started to look at their work, I also had to fight. I also had to. I shouldn't say fight, but I also had to take a critical stance toward some of the work done today that kind of put them in a, in a very simplistic register of modern categories. Like they're doing a more objective aesthetics, whereas modern sub, modern aesthetics has become too subjective. I think rejecting that category as very helpful for understanding the past, I think, is an important step because it doesn't give us a lot of explanatory power when we want to look at sort of pre-modern understandings of beauty um, and where the aesthetic comes from because it's much richer. It's never simply objective or subjective. There's a whole dimension there that's much richer. And so that's really where I'm coming from with this, what you're calling a recovery. Um, in a sense, it is a recovery, but in a sense, it's also <clears throat> trying to understand what that recovery would look like within a framework that respects and wants to um, wants to find out how certain modern trends also fit that picture. So, so it's like without rejecting that, how, how can a recovery also take place and in the embrace of some of those, some of those sort of dimensions of modern thinking. But it's true, yes, I mean, there's a sense in which beauty is still maintained as being a transcendental. So that's certainly the case, and that will, of course, cause problems for, you know, um, ways of thinking that are wedded perhaps too much so to certain modern trends that would not admit of transcendence. My Cascade Companion is um, a, a companion for the tradition of theological aesthetics or theology of beauty. And it's an introduction into this tradition. Um, it begins from the point that beauty is a divine name, so it starts within that tradition, and it traces sort of the development of that in its origins within the ancient Greco-Roman world. It kind of looks to even the, the scriptural world, um, and then the early church, and it sort of traces that development all throughout um, the development in the Middle Ages in the West, Under also looks to the East in figures like Dionysius, so it's a kind of coalescence of many figures all at the service of this theology of beauty, this tradition that was always there when beauty was part of the tradition of theological inquiry in a more explicit sense. And so it kind of taps into projects like von Balthasar's project because he's doing something very similar. Um, and any project today that would be called theological aesthetics because it, there's a debt to any theological aesthetics to this tradition of beauty and understanding where beauty enters the sort of Western intellectual tradition. Where does it enter it? Obviously it's there from the beginning. People want to understand what this is. And then it enters the theological tradition more explicitly, primarily through the divine name tradition, um, insofar as that's the tradition that identifies beauty and God, making beauty something much more significant for theological inquiry. And so my companion is designed to sort of unpack that, what that looks like. Um, and it kind of makes two claim, so it does this in two ways. It looks at the way in which beauty has been an object of inquiry for theological thought, but it also looks at the way that beauty, in being an object of inquiry, also takes hold of the one inquiring and provides to the one inquiring a new way of thinking, enable, enabling the person whose first word is beauty to ask different questions and to think about things differently. And so I, I kind of, so for example, it may be odd to see a section on Anselm and his demonstration for the divine presence, which I think today is often misnamed as a proof for God's existence, which it's really not. Um, and, I, and I use that to show what thinking is like when, when the mind, when the intellect thinks within a kind of conditions of beauty where God is understood as beauty and where beauty is understood in the classical sense within within all these principles as a unity and plurality as a surplus of intelligibility as a mystery that draws us into itself as this power that calls the intellect to inquire in the first place and so there's a sense in which I see in say example for example Anselm's um, work in that respect a profound respect for mystery but a desire also to understand it. So if it's faith-seeking understanding and that whole thing. So it's, it's those two things together. On the one hand, beauty is an object of inquiry. On the other, what it is that beauty does when it takes hold of a person and, and how it, 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 it provides a kind of basis from which a new type of theology might emerge. But not new, I mean new in the sense that the old is new again <laughs> in that respect.
Yeah, that's, that's one of the, I think that's one of the more powerful um, aspects of beauty is that it, it, it resists, it resists capture. It's like, um, I mean, you can use many images. It's like a lover that continually woos the person, but never actually, you know, fully exhaustively shows oneself. It's, you know, it's, it, and it does this because it is the, it is a principle of attraction, um, much like the good. It is what draws us into itself and it provokes us to want to know more. It provokes a desire for closure that you're kind of talking about, which has become, which has become the mark, of, I think, of a lot of modern thought, which is good because, you know, that's obviously given us technology and these kinds of things. I mean, there's a sense in which what we might call determinate intelligibility, I don't know if that's too much of a jargony word, um, intellig things that are intelligible, but in a way that we possess that knowledge. We understand it to a degree where there is no longer a mysterious quality to it. And that's sort of how we want to know because it, it does show, as you rightly pointed out, it shows a mastery over the content we're trying to know. Whereas with beauty, beauty is the, 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 the surplus that remains after all is known. There's always going to be a more. And it's experiences of beauty that constantly remind us about that. And it challenges us today because it... It, it confronts us with the need in our thinking to be patient before our objects of inquiry, not to try to simply master them, but to respect a sense of otherness that is involved in all desire to know. There's an other that we are encountering. So I think it poses a challenge to a lot of those t currents of thought that have rejected you know, the, the notion of transcendence whatsoever, um, because beauty is a constant reminder that there is an other that in many ways F compels obedience. So one of the, the other principles that I kind of stress is certainly when I'm teaching undergrads and certainly within this companion that beauty commands obedience in a way that doesn't stifle the will but frees the will but it still commands obedience. It commands obedience immediately when a person sees something beautiful they can't but submit to its beauty and that doesn't mean that it's the same for everybody beauty is such that it releases a radical subjectivity when it comes to one's appreciation of it but it's a subjectivity that ultimately wants to be shared with a more universal experience of beauty itself which is where this idea of unity and plurality becomes very important especially you know in a, in a society like ours that are struggling to try and understand unity and plurality together beauty is God's public presence I think becomes a profound and important way that we might be able to, you know, answer some of the questions around unity and plurality. But, but again, back to the, sort of the question you were asking, um, it challenges our, our need to have to sort of know everything in a determinate way, and so it challenges us to sit more patiently, to be more contemplative. These are all things that are associated with the tradition of beauty as well. Beauty compels a contemplative posture toward itself. Um, it, it brings us into its thrall, where we are sort of arrested from the flux of everything we're doing, and we are, in beholding it, we are quite literally being held by the, the, uh, the beautiful other. So, so I think not only does it challenge certain ways that we think today, but it, it challenges them in a way that ought to release a sense of delight when we fail in our challenges. That the modern mind, and I don't want to generalize, but the modern mind that, that wants to know things with mastery confronts beauty that resists that final mastery but gives always gives enough that we want more and more and more and when we sort of realize that this is a relationship that's perhaps never ending instead of being a source of um, anxiety it should really be a source of delight that, that here's here is a mysterious other that that energizes our desire to know and that will never be ultimately exhausted and that's not a bad thing The importance of Christ within the, the tradition of beauty is, I mean, how can I, what word can I put on it? It's center, and I'm, that's why I'm glad you asked that question because I haven't spoken much explicitly about that, but, but it is, I think, the center point of the entire tradition of, of the theology of beauty. Um, because sort of as I argue in the first book, the, the whole Greco-Roman sort of struggle and Neoplatonic struggle with trying to understand the phenomenon of beauty based upon Greek reason alone unlocks a great deal of, of the mystery of it because of their inability to really resolve what it is they thought they could resolve. Although they really tap into, 
you know, the idea that maybe there isn't a resolution, um, that maybe there's something about beauty that isn't intended to, to be resolved. And then what you get, I think, in the, in the Christian understanding with, with the incarnation is precisely that, that in this person, these different dimensions of the beautiful, the supernatural, the natural, the, the spiritual, the material, all these things kind of coming together, dwell in a unity of the person of Christ. And then dwell in the unity in the person of Christ hanging on a cross, um, which in certain thinkers, certainly in the tradition, and this is sort of what gets stressed in the companion in the existential tradition with Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky, that event becomes itself the, the most significant evidence that beauty, as Dostoevsky says, will redeem the world. There's controversy over what that means, you know, and, and it's in the mouth of one of his other characters. But um, for, the, for the tradition up, in, up from the beginning of sort of the theological tradition after, you know, the beginning of the church up until the scholastic period, Christ was understood to be the, that person of the Trinity, or the Son is that person of the Trinity, I should say, who most represents beauty because of the fact that he is the perfect express image of the Father without exhausting the Father. So the question of the cross um, becomes a very significant question in terms of what that means in, in that respect, Christ as image of the Father, image of, of the Father because he perfectly images the Father without actually being the same as the Father. So there's unity and plurality that's there. And, and this can become controversial. I mean, um, you know, does the cross reveal something of the divine itself, or is it just the event that happens when the divine confronts the, the worldly other, and so he ends up on a cross? That, that's not an easy question to answer, I think. But what it does show, at least according to figures like, you know, Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky, is that beauty brings with it a sense of suffering. There is a sense of suffering that comes with beauty. Only I mean, it's the suffering of, of sort of the will having to confront the fact that it's, it's not self-sufficient, it, that there's a more to it, that it, it kind of goes back to the question about mastery. We, we might tend to think of our inability to master something as an anxiety, but, but this idea that beauty suffers brings with it this notion that that, that doesn't have to be an anxiety. That's a good thing. Um, I mean, the cross is, yeah, the cross is that pinnacle of what beauty is, because there you have, for the first time in the history of the world, perhaps, the the most intense manifestation of beauty and ugliness brought together, um, showing the power of its redemptive capacity, you might say, to sort of turn the ugly into a center of worship and, and sacrifice and, and sacrality. Um, and, you know, what more power is there in the world than for something to be able to do that, to, to sort of, you know, bring a kind of strength in this in the suffering a kind of sacrifice making a sacrifice holy making it part of a instead of driving us away from the divine making it something that brings us closer to it um but yeah it's a very good question i mean the, the cross is right there at the center of it all really yeah and it should get stressed more um i mean i think von balthazar stresses it quite a lot you know <laughs> in fact he's the one who gets into controversy over whether i think it's von balthazar whether or not i think he argues and I say I think because obviously I'm on record, so I may be wrong. <laughs> but I think, as I understood him, uh, you know, that the cross is actually a revelation of the inner Trinitarian life. And of course, this becomes problematic because it at least imply, has theological implications that are problematic. You know, is there a suffering side of God? And I think that that's clearly in the tradition. There is a divine type of suffering. But I don't want to say more because I might get in trouble, too. <laughs> right? censored by the church or something. I don't know. I, I think it's a great speculative question, not easy to answer. But with respect to the discipline of, of theology of beauty or theological aesthetics, that is the most important um, moment, we might say, in that, in, in that understanding. Yeah. Yeah, there were, I mean, there's a, a pantheon. I don't know. I mean, to pick one would be tough, um, you know, because there's different, different figures at different stages of my life. In high school, I was deeply Im impressed and influenced by the theology department at my high school, um, at a Jesuit high school. Kind of turned me on to the notion of theology to begin with. Um, as an undergrad, you know, I had a professor who ended up becoming another mentor for me later on in life, uh, Fritz Bauerschmidt, who's at Loyola. Um, as a grad student, I met Graham McAleer, who was at Loyola, who turned me on to Aquinas in ways I hadn't seen yet. And that's when I met Desmond as well. <clears throat> and I think it was Desmond work, Desmond's work that continually provoked me because 
r reading him at first was like poetry. You know, I mean, it, he, do he doesn't write poetry, he writes philosophy, but because of my own kind of lack of, of knowledge, it w but it drew me in, it was beautiful. It drew me into it, I didn't understand it, but there was something about it that continually drew me to it to kind of constantly read and reread what he was saying. And, it re and very much like his own thought, it released new ways of mind in, in me. It released um, ways of opening myself to the otherness of the world that really, I think, allowed me to see Aquinas, Dionysius, and all the figures that I read in a different light um, and impressed me in, in a number of ways. So I would say that it, excuse me, it, was primarily, it was primarily Desmond, but of course there's others along the way. Um, I'm actually dedicating my companion to, to my, high school, my former high school teacher. Uh, he had he passed away the summer of cancer, so it was. Um, I mean, but he was the first one who I really sort of saw uh, a living theology. Uh, a the he was doing theological aesthetics before I even understood what that was. His kind of teaching in high school um, classroom had this tremendous aesthetic side of, of trying to understand the way in which God comes to us in our experiences of beauty, our experiences of the arts, our experiences of of human interaction. And this is really what theological aesthetics is, trying to understand God's presence in, in beauty and in our experiences of beauty.